Hello, this is Scottish Independence Podcast, episode number 154. And in this episode, I'm presenting a talk that was given by Leslie Riddick recently called McSmorgasbord. And the reason for this is that too often recently, the choices for Scotland are being portrayed in a way that it's too binary. One part of the choice that is secure, though, is that if Scotland remains in the United Kingdom, we're going to be faced with increasing austerity, hard Brexit, Tory rule, governments we didn't vote for, and an attitude in Westminster summed up quite nicely by this Conservative MP, which I've absolutely got to let you hear. Landslides do not, on the whole, produce effective government. So our Prime Minister can rest assured of an effective and smooth five years. (laughs) And it was the home of Oliver Cromwell, who defeated the Scots at Dunbar, incorporated Scotland into his protectorate, and transported the Scots as slaves to the colonies. (laughs) (laughs) Now, there's an answer to the West Lothian question. Oh, how we laughed. Better together indeed. But as I said before, that's one of the options. On the other side of the argument, if Scotland goes independent, the options are many. Let's go to Leslie's talk and I'll have a wee word with you at the end. The audio isn't wonderful as it was recorded live in a cafe, but it's definitely listenable. You know, the, the whole European thing has looked like a bit of a mess. It looks to the independent side like a bit of a kind of weak point. Because last time around, everybody in Europe was playing games with their own political domestic situations and trying to suggest that Scotland was just going to be a huge problem in Europe. Um, actually, it needn't be like that at all. And what we have tried to do with this book called McSmorgasbord, it was going to be called Scotland after Brexit, but that just seemed more really interesting. <laughs> well, the idea is that within the Nordic nations, you have a veritable smorgasbord of different possible relations with Europe. Small countries have got lots of different ways of being with Europe, and the way that they've chosen is generally dictated by what is in the interest of that country. I mean, it kind of goes without saying. But astonishingly in Britain, where nothing is about what's in the economic interest of the country, you have to kind of say it because it seems to be unusual. So if we had a conference in October last year, had speakers from each of these countries, and began to realise as we were listening to them, that there's a whole range of different ways Scotland could be in Europe. And to be honest with you, I couldn't even say myself now, having listened to all of them and edited all of this, which one would be best. It's that good. <laughs> Um, really the way it works within the Nordic countries, and it, it would be great if we could have shown you a picture just to remind you of what they all are, but yeah, thank you very much. It moves from Finland, um, which is right slap bank against Russia. Well, Finland is the most keen of the Nordic countries, the most keen Europhile, and it's for one very simple reason, really, um, they're right up slap bang against Russia. Um, Ludovic Kennedy once quoted somebody else as saying that Scotland was in bed with an elephant being in a union with England. Now, in that case, Finland is in bed with Stegosaurus. It's also kind of taken a nasty wee turn lately. You know, it's a a scary position to be in. And uh, the Finns have actually got it written into their constitution. They have a constitutional block on being a member of NATO. Because even that would be seen as provocative to Russia. So for them, the only security that they've got is the European Union. It's their defence policy. It's what makes them feel Western. It's what begins to make them have an identity that isn't just constantly sitting on the edge of this gigantic other Eastern state. So for Finland, it makes quite a lot of sense to be hugely keenly European. They're also in the Europe. They really have gone the whole hog. And right on the other extreme are the North Atlantic states of Iceland and Norway, and actually in the middle of it, the Faroes, it's not a state that it would like to be, but which is just a collection of 40,000 people on 18 of the most barren goddamn islands you'll ever see in your life, right? (laughs) Who nonetheless have the world's truly most powerful devolved parliament. But anyway, this group, for them, fishing is such a huge proportion of their economy that when the option of being EU members was raised, they took one look at the common fisheries policy and just went, nah. 
And that was it. They just didn't consider it further. Um, so Iceland and Norway joined what was known as the, the European Economic Area. To get this straight, you've got to kind of imagine, back in the 1960s, 70s, there were two trading clubs on the go in Europe. One was the one which was to become the European Union, but the other one, the little underdoggy one that didn't really do as well, was after the European Free Trade Area. So they were both trying to get members. Um, EFTA has now got Norway, Iceland, uh, Liechtenstein and Switzerland in it, I think. Um, so it's not doing that well for it, you know, as against the 28 members of the EU. But nonetheless, what they have managed to do, those of them which want to trade within Europe, have been able to do that via the European uh, Economic Area. That is the 28 people in the EU, plus the three of the four in EFTA who want to trade in Europe. That is the EEA. And if you look at it in, a, in, a, in another way, I mean the EEA in a way <clears throat> is a bit like the saucer <clears throat> to the EU cup. The EEA is the fundamental things. It's the single market. It's the, the freedoms, freedom of movement and trade and so on. The cup are the policies which you might or might not be interested in. The cup has the policies like the common agricultural policy, not too sure about that. The common fisheries policy, disastrous. The customs union, you might not want that if you're going to be an independent country actually, in Scotland. And so a lot of problematic things are sitting in this cup. It's not probably wrong with the underlying principles, that's the EEA, it's the cup that's causing a few difficulties here. So could, is there a possibility you could have one without the other? Well, that's precisely what the North Atlantic states of Norway and Iceland have done. Um, when they entered, particularly Norway, whose politicians were very keen, the, the Norwegians are huge internationalists, very keen on Europe, and uh, their politicians wanted to full, be, become full members of the EU, but their people didn't. Um, they had two referendums, and 70% of people outside Oslo voted no, 70% of people in Oslo voted yes. And such is the way that the population is dispersed around Norway, 70% out of Oslo wins. So now only 18% of Norwegians would even want to be in the EU. They, they joined the EEA for what they thought would be a halfway house. And that's why it's become known as the halfway house. Because Norway, and to a lesser extent Iceland, thought they would graduate to become full EU members. Actually, when they got there, they began to think, for us, what is not to like? We don't have to have any arguments about fishing, and boy, the Icelanders do not have arguments about fishing. Some of us are old enough to remember the Cod Wars, the only form of uh, <coughs> violence that, that the Icelanders have ever been engaged in, actually, when they had a merry race with uh, the British fleet, who were trying to make them return to the uh, pre the limits before they unilaterally decided they were having a 200 mile limit. They just said, well, they declared it gradually, but finally they declared a 200 mile limit. Iceland, 300,000 people. It's Wormit. <laughs> you know, it's Wormit, Newport, and kind of, you know, Tayport, right? That, the, the, so the country of Iceland <coughs> decided to unilaterally declare a 200 mile limit, and it saw off the British Navy mostly because the Americans regarded Iceland as too strategically important to lose or to annoy. So actually, they'd already told the Brits they weren't going to be supporting them. There were Brits right there on their own. And the Icelanders literally ran rings around them. So you don't mess with the Icelanders about very much, actually, but certainly not about fish. Um, now, the, the situation for Denmark is interesting, too. The Danes joined in 1973. And at that very point, the pharaohs that I mentioned earlier, if Iceland is a bit staggering with its tiny 300,000 population, the pharaohs is just, I'm just left speechless. Has anybody been to the pharaohs? Uh, there's a couple of direct flights this year. I think uh, Flyby and somebody else is going there, so it's actually you can get there. It really is quite extraordinary. There's 40,000 of them. Right, what are we now talking about? The bus stop of Tayport. <laughs> um, 
And they, in 1973, they had such a powerful devolved government that they simply chose not to join. They were that powerful. And the reason they had that is because in 1946, they had an, a, ref, an, a referendum on independence and bear in mind at that point there was probably 30,000 of them voting for independence and they voted 50.7% they voted yes. Now at that point the, the Danes did what the Brits could have done but of course would never do because otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here tonight accommodated them um, and thought quite cleverly the thing to do here is to give them a really powerful parliament not pretending powerful one, but measurably powerful. So in 1946, the Faroese got the powers over practically everything. Um, they, they can sign international treaties. We can't. Um, they have a university, 40,000 people. They have their own university that teaches in Faroese, not in Danish, because it's different. Um, and they have, just while we're at it, because we're coming up to local elections, 40,000 people have 30 councils. <laughs> In Scotland, 5 million people have 32 councils. So it's a radically different outlook. These people have really got a grip of the ground because they run everything, you know, really, really locally. So anyway, so the Faroese who had had that powerful parliament since 1946 took a look at the EU in 1973 that Motherland Denmark was joining saw that common fisheries policy and just went, no. Nah. And at that point just decided not to join. And they were able to not join. It was, there was no argument. Um, they have continued and have done drip deals themselves. Um, their biggest deal is selling fish to Russia. Their second biggest deal is selling fish to England. Via Denmark, which they cutely use as a landing pad for the EU to sell stuff to England when they feel like it. So that's how they operate. Um, and Greenland, which is another territory of Denmark, uh, but was less powerful, when it got the same powers uh, as, as the Faroes did in 1985, it also opted straight out of the, out of the EU um, because it too didn't want to be part of that fishing policy. And that's why you'll have heard people describe things like a reverse Greenland for Scotland, because in the way that Greenland, which was uh, a member, came out, the argument would be that Scotland could try to have a differentiated deal. Um, as you can see, it's not quite the same because Scotland has, you know, it's not, we're not going in a reverse direction. This time, the Scots are just trying to remain. We're just trying to stay as EU members. But it's maybe worth thinking about, in a way, what our future might be here because we're either, well, we are, Scotland is certainly a North Atlantic state. It's maybe a wee while for the penny dropping, and actually it's terribly ironic. Sitting in a, a town, a city like Dundee, um, people should, have, of all people, should understand that Scotland is a North Atlantic state. Dundee, with its whaling, preceded the Norwegians in a lot of the seas off Greenland. Um, there's been huge, ex obviously huge um, expeditions from Dundee to the north out of here, but for some reason we think Scotland is the central belt. This is problematic to put it mildly. This would be like Oslo thinking that it's sort of somewhere in the middle of Germany, because Oslo is actually closer to Germany than it is to the north of its own country. But it doesn't think like that because it's taken great strides to not think like that. You have to kind of make an effort to think where you are geopolitically and where we are is we are a North Atlantic state. That is not a bad thing either. You might have noticed that the North Atlantic states are kind of generally speaking doing okay. There are many things that argue that in terms of resource acquisition, in terms of fisheries, in terms of uh, shipping passage, that much is moving north in the world. And there's nothing to be particularly worried about being a North Atlantic state. Um, in fact, there's probably a lot to be gained by Scotland having someone come and administer a pretty smart tango across our faces. And